It looks great, Barry. Okay. All right, let me click. All right, get that. All right. So what I'm going to do this uh, morning is kind of just give you a quick overview of some of the things that are shaping the the market today. Some of these things we we can deal with. Many of those we can deal with as an organization. Some of these things are out of our control. So I thought I would cover some of those, and then that kind of sets up the uh, where we're going to uh, look on the margin in terms of emphasis, certain areas, and uh, hopefully uh, begin to uh, get some solution to some of the problems that have uh, been out there. Uh, I'll start by just kind of saying, um, you know, like I said, there's there's some things. Oops, there we go. There's some things we can do, some things we're uncontrollable issues. We still will have to deal with them, but there's not a, something that we're going to do about it in terms of this happening with or without us. Global economic conditions, that's that's one that you know affects the market. Uh, it affects uh, the most important component of uh, demand on a global basis is whether or not the economies of the world are growing, accelerating, or whether they're in sort of retreat mode and slowing down. Cheap polyester prices is something we've had to deal with really since about 2012 or so. Um, we just have to make cotton, you know, a better a product to compete with that, but we can't do anything about the 55 cents a pound polyester prices in China. Of course, we're dealing uh, on a global basis with US-China political tensions. Um, that does shape uh, economic conditions, especially if we get into some kind of uh, accelerated trade issues um, with China and the rest of the world, China and the US. And what we're facing is their increased uh, consumer and brand retail demands. People want to know how products are made. They want to know, um, you know, the environmental impact of products today. And that's going to not going to go away next year, the year after. That's just something we're going to have to deal with longer term. And last but not least, uh, all these things, there's kind of interrelated. Uh, the landscape for global textiles is changing. It's going to accelerate. We're seeing that uh, some of the factors that are causing that are cost, but most of this is, is a lot driven by what's happening between the US and China and also China and some of the other countries, uh, developed uh, countries. So the landscape's gonna change um, and we're gonna have to, can't control that, but we can certainly control uh, what we do about it. One of the things that's been uh, sort of a, an anomaly is that we've had kind of a historically wide gap between uh, what consumers are spending on textiles and what the supply side is doing. The supply side in the US is, you know, we look at imports of textile products. This is imports of all textiles, not just uh, cotton. But what's happened, they typically move together. They move together on the downside of COVID. COVID, uh, you know, we had a big rebound after with all the stimulus money. And now we've had a situation where spending is kind of held up, but uh, the import side has not. I think a lot of that is, you know, some of that is inventory uh, situation. Also, it, it may be the fact that uh, a lot of brands, retailers are cautious. They want to hold inventory when there's so much uncertainty in the marketplace. The good news to that is if things were to settle down, people get more comfortable that we're not going into recession or consumers are going to back away from spending, then you can see the import numbers coming up. And the reason that's important, that is probably also indicative in some cases of many other countries. So when the supply, when the when, when things get a little bit better and uh, brands retailers start ordering more product, that'll filter its way all the way into the spending side, and we'll see the demand numbers could jump pretty quickly. But we just don't know when, um, you know, right now and how much. This is a graph showing kind of how the retailers have adjusted over time to it with. You know, major events. They had done a pretty good job of being able to function with lower inventories. Um, you know, normalized inventory sales ratios for clothing and apparel stores, uh, accessory stores were, you know, maybe 2.6. And then after the financial crisis, uh, that dropped to a normalized level. You know, it was, uh, it doesn't sound like much going from 2.3 to 2.6, but that's pretty significant change in the uh, inventory sales ratio in terms of what's normal. Uh, and then we, after COVID, it looks like we're probably at another drop in terms of in, uh, uh, brands, retailers holding less inventory. Uh, the numbers would suggest the inventories are slightly probably higher than they should be, but uh, eventually those things get worked out and we can see uh, maybe some normal uh, connectivity between what's happening at the retail market and what's happening on the supply side or the import market. Oops, let me go back one. Um, one of the things that's happened um, is 
in the in the marketplace is that oops here we go can you see that okay i'm i'm seeing it the, the, is yeah it, it's, we can you know, see okay. it well Barry. okay great um, one of the ways we look at it is we look at uh, consumer spending on clothing. Clothing represents about 75, maybe to 78 percent of the demand for cotton is going to go into uh, apparel or, or, or you know, garments. About 20, 22 percent is going into home textiles and then a couple percent going into like medical textiles or non-wovens. And, you know, the, if you adjust for price changes, you know, you kind of look at volume relative to volume. Uh, Consumer spending on clothing has been fairly constant as a percentage of overall uh, consumer spending. Um, again, these are adjusted for price changes. But then once COVID hit, you know, we had a, a situation where consumers completely backed off spending on, on, on clothing. They figured the, it, the world was coming to an end. It didn't come to an end. And then they needed a lot of clothes. So they looked at the bounce back and went sky high as a percentage of the total. It's come down recently, but still remains above normal. Uh, and this makes forecasting kind of tough because what we have to, we don't know is, are we at a kind of a new normal, which is a little higher, or is this going to drift back to the pre-COVID trend line? If it does, then we still have a couple more years or a year or so of sort of uh, weak demand. If it stays at this higher level, then you know that's a little more optimistic. We just don't know right now. A lot of things have, uh, you know, change since COVID. Some of these things are more permanent changes. Some things will eventually drift back to uh, pre-COVID norms. But uh, this is one, it was not unexpected that things were gonna come back down. We just, again, don't know how much. The home furnishing side is a little, uh, fairly similar. You know, it had kind of a long-term sort of, this is um, an index of spending on, on home textiles. Uh, it moves with the business cycle. It dropped with COVID. We had a mass, massive expansion after COVID. People were staying at home. They were not going out. They were spending money on their houses. And typically when you have a lot of housing turnover and remodeling, you have a, a big demand for home textiles. And that happened, imports rose. And now that's also kind of settled down to something close to the pre-COVID uh, trend line. So we've had a lot of volatility in the market. Um, like I said, I think brands and retailers right now globally are pretty cautious. So anything we can, if we can see some recovery on the, um, on the economic side, we have room to stimulate demand um, at the mill level. But that typically comes, um, you know, once you begin to see sort of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, oops. What I have here is, um, you know, you look at services. This is sort of something, this is really what's driving sort of the volatility in the apparel market is, you know, normally services, which would be non-physical goods, that represents most of consumer spending, whether you're talking about, okay, sporting events, or you've got uh, doctor's visits or anything, hotels, flights, things that are not physically, you know, tangible goods. Um, so that's been on a slight downtrend prior to COVID, but when we had all the lockdowns with COVID, people just, they stopped doing these things and, and the services part went, dropped pretty dramatically as a percent of the total. We had never seen that before. Now be, things are opening up. The services component of the consumer spending are beginning to increase. Again, the big question, is it gonna go back to the pre-COVID trend line or is it gonna stay you know, the, a new sort of level? I don't know that, uh, but as it goes up, that means less as a percent is going to goods and that typically is negative for apparel. So we at least look like we're close to getting back to sort of something kind of normal, but it's again, it's hard to predict at this time. So I said the, the big thing we're looking at in terms of the global market is will global GDP uh, rebound. And this is the International Monetary Fund uh, estimates. If you go back, you know, sort of 1990 to 2019, that's the yellow bar there. GDP growth globally was about 3.6%. And 2020, and that's the COVID year, you know, of course, we had the biggest drop, I think, in the, in the, you know, the records that we had, I think, going back to like 1980, they show on their website. There's never been one that, that was that severe. Then with all the stimulus money around the world and just a natural recovery, we had a massive increase in GDP, about 6% 21. Now we kind of have the post-stimulus hangover and along with some of the other issues that are driving demand or excuse me, uh, driving the economy. So we really had a slowdown in 2022 and the IMF is forecasting this year to be a slightly lower growth rate 
and they've, they've just kept it flat for 24. Normally, when things recover, they, they, they bounce back more than that. And I think they're just being cautious, but that's going to be the real key. And 24, which is going to be the main thing that drives the 23, 24 global uh, market cut from a demand side, I would like to see that number bouncing back to you know 4% or so. It's hard to say where that will, will come from. China's economy is slowing down. Our economy has been pretty flat. So, but that is a key because if you go back and look at historically when cotton demand has had a, a, you know, a jump, it's almost always associated with uh, either a recovery from a very severe drop and or uh, just a st an increase in the rate of growth uh, globally in terms of GDP. So that's the big unknown right now. Um, and that's gonna play a major role in demand, which of course is gonna influence the value of cotton. So getting into like what we were trying to work on, you know, the, the process that we use uh, in the Cotton Research and Promotion Program is a very iterative process. It starts with the Cotton Board, um, a meeting that goes way back into the March. You know, they hear from our staff. Um, they hear what, our, what we think are really important. They have their own ideas in terms of other things that they'd like to see uh, working on. And this is just sort of the summary on the margin, like what should we be looking at? Traceability, and I'm gonna cover some of these, uh, is, is something like I said, brands, retailers, consumers wanna know where product is coming from. There's a, a new law that was passed in or enacted last June, which is certainly having a major impact on the ability to get product in from certain countries, I'll cover that. Sustainability has, has been something that's been important now for you know a decade or so. It continues to grow, and now the big uh, sort of within sustainability, circularity is something that people are looking at. In other words, what happens to your product when it, when end of life? Uh, the old days of just tossing it out is probably not going to be the way we do it in the future. There's going to have to be some way of continuing to repurpose uh, goods, maybe not in the same format as they were before, but nevertheless sort of the throwaway society is certainly a negative for sustainability and more and more brands and retailers are looking at that. <clears throat> Farm profitability, we know there's a very important component of, you know, you can't sell product if, you can, if you're not gonna grow it. So farm profitability is an issue and that's related to cotton seed value as well as contamination. We've been looking at plastic contamination as uh, something we should be focused on because we want to have the most value for US cotton as we can possibly get. Plastic contamination not only affects the bales that are affected by plastic, but even we're seeing the premium for U.S. cotton over time drifting lower. So we've got to change that. So now some of the things that, you know, in, in addition to what you saw before, we still have to do our sort of regular job of promoting cotton to the consumer. We've got to market to the supply chain. Uh, we've got to continue to give brands, retailers in the supply chain uh, ideas of why cotton should be considered. Um, uh, like the same thing with consumers, why should consumers care? And then you have the things that I've mentioned before, sustainability, circularity, traceability, uh, producer profitability, including uh, the contamination issued and seed value. So one of the things that's, uh, that is not only a, a struggle for uh, Cotton Incorporated, but any organization, particularly the cotton organizations that in many cases don't have inflation protection, is that this, these last couple of years have been, been kind of tough in terms of eroding the value of the budgets or you know whether it's a farm budget or whether it's a cotton incorporated or any other cotton organization. Uh, in, ex, inflation is a big deal. You know, From 2000 to 2019, we were in a period where inflation was just over 2%. It was pretty consistent year to year. Um, then we had COVID in 2020 and prices kind of collapsed early on. We only had an inflation rate of about a little over 1% 2020. But like I said, what comes with some of the stimulus money and, and the Russian-Ukraine war and, and input costs rising is inflation began to increase for the first time in quite a while, over 4.5% 21. And then we hit a huge number in 2022, about 8%. And even though inflation on the margin is coming down uh, the first half of the year, it was just under 5%. So if you're talking four and a half percent, then eight percent, and five percent, it kind of erodes, you know, the same amount of money. Um, in many cases, uh, it just doesn't go as far. So that's one of the things we always are looking at is, with the budget we have and inflation, we have to figure out 
you know, for every new thing we take on, we've got to find a way to cut somewhere else. And that's always the big struggle um, in terms of managing an organization because we, we see a lot of opportunities, a lot of things we ought to be working on, but we can only uh, have priorities on, on so many. So kind of giving you an understanding of like how we allocate the money at Cotton Incorporated, uh, you take the total budget, which is coming up in a year, it's gonna be up about 1.2%. You back out sort of the operations component of that, which is, you know, the people we have, uh, the rents, utilities costs, uh, board meetings, all, all the uh, components of operations, and you're left with program dollars. So in this year, um, the biggest, which is always the biggest component, is the consumer side. We have four committees, consumer, agriculture, research, supply chain, marketing, and R&D. Consumer is the largest, $29 million. That'll be about flat from last year. Um, negative 1.2%. Uh, the ag research budget has two pieces to it. It has sustainability as well as the core budget of ag, actually three, and the state support program. So collectively, all three of those, it's a 1.5% reduction with most of that coming from state support because that's determined on a formula. So we've had some short crops in the last couple of years. And there's like a five-year average that, that drives that uh, and so we're likely to see kind of a sluggish numbers in the state support program for a while, but they'll hopefully cycle up over time. The third component uh, is, uh, lo third largest is the supply chain marketing. That's where we're working with the brands, retailers, not only in the US, but globally. Uh, that's up 3.4%, but that also includes our contribution to CCI, which is $2.9 million. It also includes the importer support program, just like the state support program. Uh, state support importers have a program as well, and their contribution or, uh, uh, in recent years has been growing. So that number is actually the state support, uh, the importer support number is actually one of the few areas that has a pretty uh, significant increase in 2024. Uh, and last is the R&D budget. That's more the textile side. That's kind of usually kind of volatile because a lot of it depends on whether we have capital needs or not, or whether we can afford capital in one particular year. Last year, I think we had some capital carryover, which kind of distorts the year by year comparisons. But that's important because the R&D side does have to support the not only the consumer marketing side, but the uh, supply chain marketing side as well. So administration is a very small part of that. Um, but you know, for the most part, many programs will have a slight decline in, in the budget for 24, but we also have we're trying to protect those that where we have initiatives that I talked about before. So I'll go through a couple of those within each of the four committees. Um, I'll start with the ag research budget. Um, that's excluding sustainability as a, as a division. Pest management, certainly uh, you know, very important in recent years. Um, you know, we have issues with uh, obviously weed resistance, new insects and pathogens are you know, coming our way. Uh, cotton seed is certainly a component, a major component of the ag research team. We have trying to improve cotton seed value two ways. Number one is in the research side, but number two is in the marketing and the marketing part is handled in the consumer marketing phase, but we're looking at planting seed as well as you know, trying to find you know, additional uh, research that would support you know, increasing cottonseed and rations, not only from uh, the feed side, but also looking at the uh, uh, possible health benefits of the oil as well. They do support the sustainability uh, efforts at Cotton Incorporated. You, know, the, you can't have a sustainability program without you know, globally with, or within the US without continuing to have improved metrics. So all these research efforts in sustainability that helps grow our profitability are very consistent, um, you know, trying to improve soil health, uh, nitrogen management, water management. We're always looking down the road, machine uh, emerging technologies, whether it's machine vision, you know, ginning, or is it an automation, potentially harvesting? Um, those are kind of down the road, but we always have to have a little bit of our budget looking at uh, longer term issues and then genomics in terms of breeding. Um, uh, genetic innovations that can help drive uh, things like yield or maybe insect resistance uh, down the road. So those are your five priorities. Uh, oops, sorry about that. The budget, the way we put most of the money within ag research in the category called production profitability. And that's one of the few categories where we have an increase in the budget. 
um, you know, every, the things that I showed before, insect weed management, nitrogen, you know, studies there. Anything that helps preserve the crop or improve the crop um, is in that particular budget. The state support budget, again, is determined by a formula for the various states. That will be down about 5% this year. We're holding the budget flat in terms of cottonseed research as well as the harvest and ginning research. Um, so no cuts there. The only cut within the ag research budget is in the state support, which is out of our control in the short term. In sustainability, you know, if you were to say, what is the, in a nutshell, what is it we're trying to do in sustainability? I would say we're trying to turn sustainability from a, a negative to a positive for cotton. And I think we've come a long way. We've uh, changed the narrative in many cases. We have a lot of things going. We have metrics for the first time here in the last you know, decade or so through field to market where we can show things, things that are improving. But we also, uh, you know, taking another step. You know, we worked with the National Cotton Council to uh, help them establish the first uh, U.S. or first countrywide sustainability goals, as well as now the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. Uh, we are the largest contributor to the protocol and have been uh, for now for four, four or so years. Uh, sustainability, we're looking at metrics always, like how can we show anything cotton advantage versus competition? How can we do uh, assessments that um, will is objective to where we can get some of those outdated um, uh, perceptions about cotton out of the you know out of the public domain. I mean, there's so many misconceptions out there. Uh, we've done an LCA at least one, maybe two. That's a life cycle assessment, um, and it's peer reviewed. And we want to, again, we just want to make sure the right information is out in the marketplace so that whoever's doing assessments of their impact, they're basing it off uh, credible data on the cotton side. I mentioned circularity and biodegradability. Um, cotton has a huge advantage over synthetics in that. It does biodegrade very quickly, 30 days and so in, in, in aqueous conditions, whereas synthetics basically stay in the atmosphere or have in the ground or in the water for indeterminate amounts of time, hundreds of years. And that's becoming a problem. You're seeing more about it. Uh, we just wanna make sure we're staying on top of the research. We're conducting research to show where we can have, cotton can have a major advantage. And then sustainability, leadership and engagement. We used to kind of stay away from some of these organizations, uh, but we now feel like it's better to get into the tent and go, go fight within to, uh, to get our message out there. And communications is always important. Um, doing all this work is not gonna be of any value if we don't get it out there. So communication, all these things are kind of interrelated, but it's a big deal. And uh, you know, in the, our, we did some work this past year, so we had a, the research in our LCA data. We will be slightly down from, uh, not slightly, we'll be down from the year ago. We can do what we need to do with this budget. What's a little misleading is the budget for the uh, trust protocol that I mentioned before. It shows down 31%, but that was because the protocol did not use all the funds in 2022 that we gave them, and uh, we allowed for carryover into this year. So rather than having a, a basis of 500 versus 500, we had a, I think, 200, roughly $250,000 carryover. So that's why you have a decline. We're gonna to continue to support the protocol um, and we are the largest contributor to, uh, to the trust protocol from an industry side. And then last is the communications and memberships. We're gonna be uh, increasing that. We, again, we just wanna stay engaged with the, uh, with the industry wherever we can. So a couple of summary points here. We're the largest contributor to the protocol. We're gonna to continue to analyze and promote cotton's advantage over synthetics. And we're gonna to continue to focus on the microplastic issue and the macroplastic issue. And we're gonna to continue to engage with sustainability organizations and try to correct misconceptions about cotton and particularly about US cotton. Now on our R&D side, uh, we have an increase in the quality research and that's kind of a, a catch all. We have a lot of things going on within that bucket, uh, regular fiber quality type research. We have research in contamination, which is gonna be ongoing. And we have a little extra money in traceability in case that some opportunities arise that we will have some resources that uh, can, go to, can go to that. Uh, we're doing quite a bit right now. And uh, you know, we know that's an important issue. Some of the other categories are basically EFS is pretty flat, um, evaluation lab, 
that's not really a cut as much as it is just matching the budget with actual expenditures. Uh, we've been underspending in that budget, I think, and so we have that down a little bit. And then there's no capital needs in this area in the, in the fiber competition uh, part of the R&D. When you get into, uh, on the margin, some of the things they really are working on is, again, the, um, we're looking at the impact of the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act, and that's the one that came into uh, implementation last June. Uh, we, uh, Vicki Martin and her team are sort of spearheading that. And one of the things that we looked at were like a survey of brands and retailers. And it's a little concerning. Only 66% of them were aware of the law. Among of those who are aware, they said 45% roughly said, we're not going to change our cotton use, but we're going to shift it to somewhere else from China to some other country. 45% uh, said they're not going to do anything, which is concerning because if they don't do anything, they're probably going to have product withheld by customs because they're going to have to be able to prove that it does not contain forced labor and proving a negative sometimes is very difficult. And again, the main reason why we're focused on this is 10% of those who said they're aware of the law said they're just going to reduce cotton usage. And why would that be? Well, the example we heard at a board meeting is to get a uh, potentially to get a cotton product into the U.S. now with the with this law, uh, it may require 200 documents, whereas getting a polyester product in would be you know 10 percent of that or less. It's becoming onerous to get product in, um, and typically they said among those that said they're going to reduce, they said that uh, the most common indicated amount would be 10 percent or more. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of that right now. Uh, it, a lot of it has to do with the way it's being enforced by uh, Customs and Border Protection. We have a multifaceted approach here. We have different areas of the company that are responsible for uh, different components of this. We work with the National Cotton Council. We now have a relationship with the Customs and Border Protection. We are communicating to brands and retailers. We're staying on top of what kind of technologies are out there. We're staying engaged with industry associations. A lot of this is... Uh, to get product in is going to be a function of how good is the paperwork. So we're looking at chain of custody providers and trying to get lists of who are the top players and, and uh, make sure that's communicated to brands and retailers. And then trying to get foreign mills uh, uh, to uh, provide more documentation, more information, because that seems to be where the bottleneck is. I, I, we hear from growers that say, why are we should we be, you know, we're doing everything we can. We have the PBI, the bail tags, but the problem is when it gets somewhere outside of the US, some of that goes away and it goes, doesn't go from brand to, excuse me, doesn't go from the mills all the way through. So brands don't know exactly where the product is made. And that's just gonna have to be a change. Uh, the US is a much better situation to deal with it. And I'm hoping at some point um, you know, we'll start seeing some more interest in what's this hemisphere. And I'll show you a slide in a minute. Uh, we have been reaching out to Customs and Border Protection. We are not allowed to influence policy, but we know that uh, from talking with them, they don't have exactly a great knowledge in some cases about how cotton is processed globally. Um, we've worked for months to try to get a connect connection with them. Uh, they came to our office now, three people that were uh, involved in textiles and footwear, as well as uh, somebody who's uh, involved in the science part of it. Um, they came to Cotton Corporate, spent a full day, had a, a very good meeting with our senior our team, and we're going to have an ongoing relationship with CBP. We already have some statement of work things going on right now. Uh, I think we can be a very good asset to them, a valuable asset in terms of helping them understand uh, what the issues are and, and help them in their testing and, and trying to look at other ways uh, of, uh, you know, navigating this sort of this process, which is, like I said, it could be very uh, negative for the cotton market, not only here in the U.S., but in some cases, other countries may be adopting similar uh, policies. So the R&D is the, the last one. Well, just mentioned uh, that's the internal. Uh, we're, again, matching some of the um, the numbers with actual spending. We're trying to preserve our outside research. We have some important projects here. We didn't want to cut. Uh, the capital needs are down significantly, but that's because it's compared to a, to a higher year. The previous year, 
uh, those those are pretty volatile and everything else is fairly fairly flat so um, again um, our team does a really good job of uh, uh, you know, understanding in some cases that on some years some area may have more uh, more needs than others and we try to put our funds that way in in those areas sometimes we can get by a year or two with a lower budget and uh, you know the team does a really good job of cooperating and and understanding that you know, what may be a negative in one year might be a positive uh, in another year if, if we have some opportunities. Um, in that area, you know, the one of the things that we are most most important is just continuing to, to show brands and retailers just ideas in cotton. These are these are fabrics that have been developed. You've heard Yvonne Johnson and uh, in, in her presentations in the past talking about. Um, you know, fabric development and the, and the challenges we face. We're always, like I said, trying to show cotton can compete and here's some great ideas. We have literally hundreds, if not thousands of fabrics archived in our uh, facilities here. And there's a, like a recipe for each one of these. So, you know, um, it could be novel constructions where one of the challenges for cotton over the last decade or two has been that we have to have lighter weight products. Uh, that's what the consumer wants like heavy khaki pants, no, nope, it needs to be lighter weight. Uh, heavy denim, nope, it needs to be lighter weight. It's just it's just the world we live in. Lighter weight means lighter, uh, probably means less fiber per garment, but we have to do that. In some cases, we may need blends uh, to help that because uh, lighter you get, you might need uh, stronger fibers so we can get that in some cases, or we may need stretch. Uh, we're not ignoring the home textile market. We continue to look for ideas there. As I said, home furnishings about 22% of the demand for cotton um, and team does a great job there. And, and performance is also an issue. We always try to, you're looking at whether it's athletic wear, consumers are looking for performance features, brands and retailers want to want to promote that. So um, you know, we, we have a pretty good arsenal now of technologies that the brands that the uh, team can take out. So I'll skip that and go right into the supply chain marketing. Uh, importer support program is the one that's up. We're keeping our CCI contribution, holding that. Um, we're doing more in strategic initiatives, but less in industry events because uh, there are not as many uh, relevant uh, textile shows. People are still not traveling as much as they used to. So that's going to be cut. And we're keeping fashion marketing flat. But, and we think there's no, uh, opportunities in non wovens particularly because of the environmental impact of, of, of uh, uh, synthetic fibers. So there's a there's a many ways that they can influence the market. I'm not even going to go through this, but think of the supply chain marketing team as they've got the they take the tools from other divisions of the company, whether we're talking about sustainability or new fabrics or whatever it may be, uh, any kind of marketing ideas, and they're working with brands, retailers, mills all around the world. I said the landscape shifting. One of the ways we can look at it is look at the percentage of the imported product of cotton coming in, what's coming from China, what's coming from India, Bangladesh as a percentage, is it changing? Well, people are getting out of China pretty rapidly right now. Where is it going? Well, India is growing, Bangladesh is growing, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia collectively were, was growing, it dropped, it's gonna drop this year and that may be because of the connections with China and it's growing in Pakistan. If I were to take a pick, the, the top three, I'd say India, Bangladesh and Pakistan on the margin is where the business may be going. We're also seeing some growth in the Americas again. I hope it's a small base right now, but I think that could continue to grow. It's a better sustainability story. It's capacity issues right now, but uh, nevertheless, uh, there may be some opportunities uh, down the road years from now, which could be beneficial for U.S. cotton. And I'm going to say the last, consumer marketing, you know, we had to, it's the biggest. So if you're, you have cut, you're likely going to see it here. Um, media can spend is going to be a down a little bit. Um, from last year, we have about $18 million in, in streaming and other services to, to reach consumers. The brand partnerships is where we work directly with retailers. We're preserving the cottonseed marketing budget. We're not cutting that. A few to cuts uh, in, in other places. So bottom line is, you know, the team does a great job. We're looking at, um, you know, continuing to look at youth and sustainability and brand working with you know, we say omni-channel, any way we can reach consumers. We're trying to get the circularity message out there that cotton is 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 a, naturally um, 
um, circular in terms of it, it biodegrades, um, communications and our research, uh, corporate strategy and insights, whatever the key issues are, we continue to uh, wanna make sure we, can, we have research to support it. Bottom line, last slide is that so many of the areas that Cotton Incorporated now, key initiatives are multi-divisional. So sometimes it's hard to look at one division and say, well, what are you doing in this topic? Um, each division plays a role. And so many of these nowadays are crossover. And, and to do that properly, we have to have good coordination within the company. And the team, I think this past year has done a really good job. So in a nutshell, that's kind of where we are. Um, many issues to deal with. Um, and one of the things that I've always said is there's more uncertainty in the marketplace today, whether you're talking about demand, you're talking about you know, what the needs are, what may grow in terms of importance. And it's really important for an organization like ours to not only have a sort of a budget to deal with some of these things, but to have a, a, the ability to be flexible. If situation changes, we need more emphasis over here or something is different. Uh, we've got to have the uh, the adaptability for that. And, and so far, that's worked pretty well. When we've needed a little extra resources, the Cotton Board's been very helpful for us there. Uh, and they also have been helpful in terms of understanding where sometimes we may have to underspend the budget to go uh, with more resources somewhere else. So that's where we are. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. <laughs>